Moses goes up to the top of Mount Sinai to receive the Torah from God. After 40 days of not hearing from him, the people of Israel not unreasonably assume that he died. They go to Aaron and demand a substitute for Moses. Aaron panics, he freezes. And the best idea he was able to come up with was telling the people, bring all your gold jewelry to me. Probably assumed that they wouldn't do it, but the people did. He collected all the gold, melted it, and what came out of it? A golden calf, an image of a young bull, which the people of Israel immediately treated like it was a god. Meanwhile, up there, God is not happy. When Moses sees it, he smashes the two tablets that he had. Eventually, he goes down. There is apologies, atonement, reconciliation, forgiveness. And some time later, God summons Moses back to receive the second set of tablets. Moses goes up. And he sees a glimpse of God's presence. And at that moment, he recites one of the most beautiful descriptions of God. It is so powerful that our ancient rabbis decided to use it as part of the liturgy of the high holidays. We say dozens of times between the beginning of Elul and Yom Kippur. In Hebrew, it says, Adonai, Adonai, El Rachum, Vechanun, Erech Apaim, Berav Chesed. Let's read it in English. Adonai, Adonai, God, compassionate, gracious, endlessly patient, loving and true, showing mercy to the thousandth generation, forgiving evil, wrongdoing, granting pardon. Ready to be shocked now? So this text that is part of our liturgy is taken from the Torah, from the book of Exodus, chapter 34. But when we read it from the Torah, it begins the same way, but at the end it says, granting pardon, he will not. Yes, you get it right. What the rabbis did for the prayer was to erase the words he will not. So what God is saying to that God will not pardon. There are sins that God refuses to forgive. But the rabbis had the audacity to take it out. Can you imagine just taking the word no from the Ten Commandments? (laughs) But that's exactly what they did there. Why? I don't know, it happened almost 2,000 years ago. Maybe because times were tough. You know, the people of Israel just lost their land. Their temple was destroyed. Hundreds of thousands of them got killed. The majority of them ended up in exile. So they didn't want any negativity. They wanted to think God only in positive terms. Maybe because they believed in the theology that we still believe that in Latin we call it imitatio dei, imitation of God, according to which we have to behave like God. And the rabbi tells us, as God is compassionate, you shall be compassionate. As God is forgiving, you shall be forgiving. So they didn't want anything negative. They didn't want, oh, God is angry, you shall be angry. God is jealous. No. So they just got rid of all the negative attributes of God And this is bad. This is a mistake. And unfortunately, we live now in a time in which the culture presses us to get rid of anything negative. Good vibes only. Always look at the bright side. Have only happy thoughts. Don't be negative. Have you heard that? A lot. And what scholars found is that people 
who deny themselves of these negative feelings of anger, of jealousy, of frustration, end up suffering. They tend to have more depression, less satisfaction with life, more anxiety. And when you think about it, it makes sense. Because, let's say I'm angry. But then, I'm angry at myself for being angry. So I pile up a bad feeling on top of a bad feeling. But this is exactly what our culture encourages us to do. Always to be positive. Feeling jealous is bad. Being frustrated, no, 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 don't be. And it's not good to deny ourselves of these emotions. It's part of a full range of emotions that we're born with, that God has given us. And to really and fully experience the world, we have to use them all. And the reason I chose to talk about it tonight in the beginning of the holidays is that I have spoken to with so many people in the past few years who more or less said to me the same thing. Normally people come to talk to me when things are not good. And they begin by saying, I know I shouldn't feel like that. Or, I know that other people suffer more, but... I think this conversation I had more than a dozen times. Only in recent time. For example, a wife comes to me after losing her husband of over 60 years of marriage. And she says, I know I should be grateful, but something is wrong. I feel anger. I feel sad. I feel fearful. No, there is nothing wrong. You should be grieving and feel sad and angry and fearful. And at the same time, you can also feel grateful. It's not either or. We can have both these feelings at the same time. But so many people today don't give themselves the permission to fully acknowledge and to feel what we call the negative emotions. I'll give you another example. I spoke to someone who told me that he closed the deal and made a lot of money. He said, I know I shouldn't feel the way I feel, but the truth is that I'm not happy. I feel jealous. I feel resentful because my partner ended up making much more money than I did. I know I should feel grateful and I should feel proud of myself, of working hard. But it's fine. If you feel resentment and jealousy, that's what you feel. And the truth is that all the feelings we have tend to pass quickly. But when we judge them, when we diminish their importance, when we suppress them, they tend to be more intense and to linger for much longer. So instead of just letting this feeling pass, we keep ruminating for hours and hours. Every high holidays, I, teach, I tell at least one story about Rabbi Dr. Abraham Tversky. And the reason I do it is that I think he's the most fascinating man who lived in the past century. He died several years ago from COVID at the age of 90-something. What makes him so unique is that he was a Hasidic rabbi with the whole thing, black hat, long white beard, always black suits, a long coat, but he was also a psychiatrist, who was one of our biggest experts in substance abuse. And he wrote many books. One of them is called The Rabbi and the Nuns. Somehow, 
He worked mostly in Pittsburgh. I think originally he was from Milwaukee, but he worked mostly around Pittsburgh. He ended up collaborating with the sister of St. Francis Order. Sounds weird, the nuns and the super Hasidic rabbi, but it makes sense because both the rabbi and the nuns dedicated their lives to help people. And both were people of faith. So they worked together. One time the mother superior called Rabbi Tversky and said, one of my nuns has a drinking problem and we think that you will be the best person to help her because you are a believing person and you will not judge her. Rabbi Tversky said, of course, I'll be happy to do that. He wrote the time, uh, and the date and the time of the appointment on his calendar, paper calendar, remember these days? But he wrote it on the wrong day. The day when, the correct day of the meeting, he happened to take a day off. The poor nun had to schlep almost two hours, taking several buses. Then she arrived at the office, and he was not there. No cell phones back then. She waited for more than two hours, because she assumed that the doctor had uh, some emergency. But after two hours, had to schlep back, take all these buses back to the, uh, to the nunnery. When Rabbi Tversky came back to the office, he realized the mistake he had done. Immediately called the convent, apologized profusely, and set another meeting. When the nun came, before she even sat down, Rabbi Tversky said, first let me tell you, I'm so sorry about what happened. And she said, no, don't be sorry. You didn't do anything wrong. He said, at least, let me reimburse you for the cost of traveling. Nuns are not wealthy people. And she said, no, no need to. And he tried to apologize. No, nothing happened. You didn't do anything wrong. So he told her, you know what? This is where we are going to start the treatment. You cannot admit that you have any negative feelings. I stood you up. You should be angry with me. You're angry and then I apologize. And then you may choose to forgive me. He said, okay, I forgive you, but please make sure that it wouldn't happen again. But you have to feel all these emotions. You cannot deny them. Unfortunately, we live in an era in which many of us deny these emotions. And sometimes the society, our friends, push us to deny them. About a thousand years ago, there was another Jewish movement, which in past years became quite popular. It's called the Musar movement. And the rabbis of the Musar movement understood something that only recently scholars understand. What they understood was that there isn't such a thing of good or bad emotions. We just have emotions and traits, and all of them are on a spectrum. Take, for example, anger. Being very angry all the time, not good. But not being able to be angry, like in the story, turns you into a doormat. You don't fight for yourself. You don't stand up for justice. No, all social movements start because of anger. So you need anger, just the right balance. Well, let's take a positive trait of generosity. But too much of that, you'll end up penniless. So what the Musa rabbis taught us, still teach us, is that no good or bad. It's a matter of balance, and all the emotions 
are just on a spectrum and we have to find the right place. And later on, scholars confirmed how right they were. All the emotions, especially the negative ones, have a purpose. When we're embarrassed, we send a signal to people to forgive us. When we are sad, we tell people we need your social support. When we are disgusted by something, it prevents us from eating the leftovers from three months ago. <laughs> Everything has a purpose. Even anxiety, when not too much, forces us to prepare. Everything has a place. Maimonides even counted it as a mitzvah. He said that when a person hurts you, it's not that you can. You must tell them, you hurt me. That's how you made me feel. That's who we meant to be, to feel full range of emotions. There is a beautiful Midrash that tells us that God showed how compassionate God was in the very beginning of the Torah, the book of Genesis, and at the very end of the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy. In the beginning of the Torah, in the story of the Garden of Eden, we read that God made garments for Adam and Eve. God actually took some leaves, some fig leaves, and stitched them into garments. That's beautiful. God made your clothes. And at the end of the Torah, we read that God buried Moses. After Moses died, it was God who took care of all the arrangements. Beautiful. At the same time, you can read the same stories in a different way. Because Adam and Eve ate the fruit, God banished them from the Garden of Eden and cursed them with all this horrible thing. And Moses, at the end of the Torah, after leading the people of Israel for 40 years in the desert, after struggling with the Pharaoh, so one day, instead of talking to the rock, he struck the rock, God said, you are not entering the promised land. You're going to die now in the desert. That sounds like an angry, frustrated God. You see, God in the Torah is a reflection of human beings, of us. And God can get angry and frustrated and jealous and regret. And so are we. We're about to start a new year. And during this year, I would like to encourage all of us to experience the beautiful world that God has given us with a full range of all of our emotions. And please, never feel guilty for feeling bad. That's who we are. We should never fight it. Shabbat Shalom and Shana Tovah.